So this is the 15th lecture in this lecture series on creating an international sustainable civilization. So it's the third lecture about the working group meetings that took place between fall of 2016 and December of 2018, uh, where members of diverse religious groups came together at the Pontifical Academy in Rome to find a common ground between members of all these religious traditions. This is definitely Ponticilla number three and four. They brought in all these representatives. In the year 2015, there was a convergence of a whole lot of things, uh, institutions, huge institutions, huge conferences, to focus on sustainability, then they, these members of these groups were brought together. Um, they tried to, they wanted to find common ground. So in the last uh, lecture, I talked about the, is the representatives from Islam, Islam, two very prominent ones. And they were one taught at a liberal arts school, a Muslim liberal arts school and one was a major scholar in developing an Islamic version of Greek ethics or an Islamicized Greek ethics. Now this one, because both of them, both of those scholars, especially liberal arts, they want to develop a curriculum, okay? And so the last lecture left where the group together want to develop a curriculum. So this lecture is about education for development and sustainable and sustainability. So there is a little section in the ethics in action for sustainable development on education. Increasing education attainment of society as a whole is perhaps the most important contributor to national economic development. Um, Education is also a prerequisite for social and political stability. When a society is divided between education haves and haves not, have nots, income inequality and social disparities are large. And also that makes the uneducated vulnerable to demagogues and populists who may successfully appeal to lead less educated segments of the population, and they can get them to believe that they're acting in God's name and they actually are just centralizing power to give to their family and friends. I mean, it's all sorts of corruption when you don't have an educated populace. That's why the United States valued liberal arts education so much. As I, as I said in the last lecture, my entire higher education has been connected directly to liberal arts schools. Uh, it's very, very important to me. I really understand the connection between liberal arts education and developing and maintaining a free society. And I also very much understand the connection between Aristotle's ethic as a foundation, not the only foundation, but a very sophisticated and systematic and comprehensive theory that you can apply to daily life. I don't know any others of the wisdom traditions if they're quite that systematic, but they might be. So I, I don't, I have not covered all of that, but I, Aristotle is certainly as good a starting place as other places is my main point. He builds the bridge between a biological view of flourishing and a religious view of flourishing. There's many different bridges that Aristotle can uh, provide the bridge. And this is what happened at this conference. People who were self-described humanists, even secular humanists, any of the religious traditions. So that's why um, I find myself very compatible. Uh, my entire career is very connected to what these people were doing. So I hope I can keep pursuing it, but I also want to keep encouraging whoever is listening to these lectures, but most likely professors at UN schools in Indonesia. Um, so what is it? Oh, the other thing about education is I did teach at a small liberal arts woman's college 
Asia University for Women in Bangladesh. And so I know about how in developing countries, not only is education important, but education for women is really important if a country wants to develop. And that's what motivated people to start this school. Actually, the Gates Foundation gave money for this, um, this school. It was a major donor sort of at the grassroots at the beginning. Also, I read a book by Melinda Gates called The Power of Lift, The Moment of Lift. And she's comparing educating women in developing countries to sort of when a plane lifts off. So you have to have a certain number of women getting educated and then the country will start lifting. You know, it'll start having this synchronistic effect that it'll be feedback loops where women can create a culture where um, education is valued. So in the lecture about child marriage, I thought if you could go on social media and interview fathers who had thought they should get their daughters married at an early age and they change their mind and then they understand why educating women is important, why Muhammad respected educating women, treating women as equals then that that's all building up to getting this lift so that a country can really um, move forward. So um, so at this conference, that's very important. They want to develop a curriculum and they have to consider the values it's based on and also the process, like how do you educate? What is, how do you get people uh, through an educational system, a curriculum, that really will lead to people with minds, people who have the moral, the intellectual virtues, and then have practical wisdom. They can use the education they have and they will have practical wisdom to be able to deliberate well and to make decisions day in and day out that are aimed at promoting human flourishing and at, at that actually succeed at that goal. Okay. Now, in the West, we have this stereotype about a free market and capitalist economics. And we have fundamentalists. People are obsessively anti-government. And that there's a history behind that, but it is not Adam Smith. And so some of the people who are considered like the saviors you know, the Jesus Christ of the religion of the free market are Adam Smith, Frederick Hayek, and Milton Friedman. And they said awful things like the only social responsibility of business is to make a profit. So corporate social responsibility is stealing people's money. And he was just a raving anti-philanthropy, anti-tax. The trouble is all three of those thought as a matter of obvious, <laughs> it would be obvious to them, you must educate the common people. The more the common people are educated, the less liable they are to the delusions of enthusiasm and superstition, which among ignorant nations frequently occasion the most dreadful disorders, right? So they understood the importance of education. Well, they did not, it seems to me, somehow they did not communicate that if you want a good education for everyone, especially as societies become more sophisticated and you need more education in order to create the products that would compete in the next uh, generation of economic development. So, they should all have known, I assume they must have written somewhere, that not only is education of the common people important, but that as the, the economies grow, as they go more international, as they exploit resources in more sophisticated ways, as each generation becomes higher tech, technology just means creation um, with your with your reason. So you create products, you have to be educated to be able to manufacture the products. 
you have to create a market for your product. Um, so as that happens, you more and more people need more and more education. Well, if that's true, you have to tax the rich to pay for education. And they just didn't say that, or at least that isn't what's gotten passed on. This obsession with not paying taxes. Taxes is stealing your money. If you want your kids to get a good education, work at a better job and save money and send them to a private school, this is impossible. And now in America, especially the whole system is set up. So parents figure out if their kid is going to get the education they need, then they set up this whole legal system where housing, you know, so you set it up so it's only very local taxes that pay for the schools. And then you go and set up neighborhoods that are full of houses that are very expensive. So only rich people can live there. And so the real estate taxes they pay create these really excellent schools where each of the students has a whole lot of money per student. Meanwhile, if you don't have the money to live in that neighborhood, your house isn't worth that much or your apartment, the rent you pay, the taxes you pay is much less. So the schools are much worse. So your kid cannot compete. And so you've set up this whole system, supposedly a free market, supposedly everyone's free to compete in the economic system, but it's not. The deck is stacked. And the, and the key is education, except that in America, we've set up a system where the key to education is housing. <laughs> and the key to housing is not being racist. And it goes on and on. So we've created a huge gap between the rich and the poor, even in a society that's very high tech and that's very wealthy. So um, it's very important that this ideology of minimal government, just let the corporations come into the developing countries and they'll exploit resources and they'll create wealth. And then the governments can distribute the wealth and everything will be just fine. And that has not worked out at all for many, many reasons. Um, so, so number one is that the myth of minimal government is the way to prosperity is false. It was never true. You always needed education, broad-based education. The second one is when societies confront complex challenges. The challenges that we have now, pandemics, climate change, species loss, is these are collective. We've got to work collectively together on these. They also require, again, high levels of education. So a poorly educated public will tend to believe and transmit fake news and propaganda. And so another reason why more and more people have to get educated, they have to get educated in, in what vaccines are, how they work, how they're developed. They have to be educated in climate change, what's going on with the climate all the data about that and they have to be able to understand that data and they have to know enough science to know this isn't made up and same with species loss they need to know a lot of biology um and they're not getting it because we're not willing to tax uh we don't pay teachers well enough and then if teachers if people who would want to be teachers would want their children to be educated if the only place they can get an education is in a suburb where the houses are expensive, they're not going to want to be teachers because they can't make enough money as a teacher to live in a neighborhood where their kids could get the schools they need to go and succeed in the economy. There are many teachers uh, in Los Angeles, in California, where housing is expensive, that either quit or else they have to work second jobs like Uber. Well, then they can't be home correcting students' papers. So they aren't able to be good teachers, even if they wanted to be good teachers. So we have this horrible syndrome. And um, at least Panchasila, Indonesia, 
has a political ideology. Their philosophy is a social contract. The government owes the citizens a high quality of public education. Like we don't even have that in our declaration. We used to, you know, at a certain point, the, the court system and the Supreme Court agreed to some right to education, but that was, you know, it wasn't in the original documents. And now the Supreme Court is undoing a whole lot of those more egalitarian interpretations of our constitution. The constitution does say that the Congress is authorized to make laws to promote the, the general welfare and so that's how we got in, got public education or public health care into our system at all. But the Republicans can come and just knock all those all those interpretations down if they want to. And that's what they're doing. So at least in Indonesia, I realize, you know, America's way ahead, although we have a lot of college educated people who don't accept climate change who refused to get vaccinated. <laughs> so uh, it's just a mess, but I will, I promise that I'll work on it in my country. Uh, Indonesia has a good foundation, political philosophy. Their trouble is of course they have poverty and they have a lot of rural areas and they have their own issues, but but each of us has a source of hope and sources of despair. Um, different sources of hope and different sources of despair, but we all need to head forward rather than sideways or backwards. Okay, here, this is how little it would cost, how little a sacrifice it would be. So there are 2,755 billionaires. They have a wealth of 13.1 trillion. This was in 2014, I think this book, no, no. The book was published I don't know, 2020, something like that, because the last meeting was at the end of 2018. So as of 2020, let's say, if they just paid 1% tax or donated 1% on their wealth, every child in the world would be educated. Of course, there's social norms, there's problems of corruption, there's problems of sexism, but just the fact that it would take that small an effort to achieve that important a goal. Unbelievable, because when you have young people get to be uh, come of age and they need a job and they're not educated, you're gonna have so much social unrest. You're gonna have so much opportunity for corrupt political operatives to manipulate those people, to get them to vote for an authoritarian leader, destroy their democracy and they still don't get educated. And their country doesn't have a future for anybody but the very top elite who interact with each other across the globe. So, so okay, given that it wouldn't be that hard, but at least let's collectively set up what it would look like if we did have a curriculum or what sort of curriculum the people in countries that actually are making the effort could actually invest in this curriculum. It has to be a holistic sustainable development curriculum, the science of sustainable development and the cultural dimensions of tolerance and peace. So this fits completely with Panchasilla. It fits with everything we've done so far in these lectures. Here's another thing that's important in terms of the process of education is neuroscience. Now we know a whole lot about the brain. So we literally can, can structure a curriculum that would stimulate our brains. Our brains are actually sets of neural, neural networks. And we aren't born with all those neural networks. We're born with the potential, okay? We're not born reading or multiplying numbers or programming computers, right? not like breathing, it's not like visual, it's not like we, even pretty lower order animals can develop memories. They can take stuff in and their brain will remember and it will recognize a similar situation. There's things, you know, that are almost 
automatic, but your brain has to be, okay. So different mammals have different levels of this, but there, there aren't any animals that are born being able to read. Like literacy changed the, the networking and doing numbers, thinking in abstractions like that. So we need to allow humans to make new circuits for cultural in inventions like literacy and numeracy. The new reading circuit in the brain needs to be built up and elaborated over time. So that's where you would need a curriculum, first grade, second grade, all the way through 12th and then college. And that's way over my head. You know, I don't, I know that that's true since I went through a system, my kids went through one. I respect people who study it really carefully, uh, uh, structure their curriculum to fit this. Essential to this process is the cumul cumulative building of background concepts. Okay, this, this to me is really important because in science and social science, it really was an effort to restructure this. We make analogies from what we know to what we read. We can go on to make inferences. Okay, that's deep reading. Well, in the ancient view, we make analogies with the distant past in the Greeks, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're, they're talking about characters from the Battle of Troy. The Battle of Troy occurred 300 years earlier. So, so everybody knows that, no, this is not journalism. This isn't history. This is not fact-driven. This is just an old story that somebody found out. And now they're creating these characters. This is a type of person. This is the type of situation. This is the lesson you can learn when you find yourself in a similar situation. So all of those myths, uh, Aesop's fables, you know, all these fables, all this stuff is based on pattern recognition. And so it's about people making analogies from what they know to what they read. Um, and that would be deep reading. It concerns the development of perspective that leads to understanding and empathy for others. So you can't go into a developing country saying, you know, we're gonna create all new history here and we're gonna teach them stuff that their parents don't know, their grandparents don't know. You know, it's all new. They can't make any analogies from what they're learning now. They can't ask their parents about it. That would be absurd. But, you know, the Enlightenment really did think we were going to socially re-engineer the human psyche. And maybe nobody ever really was as good as their theory. I don't know. I mean, when B.F. Skinner talks about beyond freedom and dignity, behavior modification, he's pretty serious about that. And he actually raised his daughter in a box <laughs> to just condition her as a child. So, I mean, that would not be deep reading. What could you have that kid read that they could identify with when she lives in a box, you know? So that that's really scary, but okay. Uh, hopefully we're done with that. It's just, we still have the remnants of that. Um, I'll tell you where we have the remnants of it. When I was in Bangladesh, there was a, you know, a pretty, influential teacher who had her students with her. And I think she taught in Japan, maybe Korea. And she had loved Jane Austen. And she grew up in an international school in some Southeast Asian country, but she was obsessed with Jane Austen. And she taught her students Jane Austen. Well, that's not deep reading. They can't make analogies. She doesn't really talk about analogies. Now, of course, you know, romance, but the context of Jane Austen, I have to admit, I sort of like it, except that I know it's colonialism. And that's really offensive. Like these people, because they're colonizing the rest of the world, because they've got slaves in America picking cotton so that they can have their dresses with five layers of cotton. And they've got these... You know, they're exploiting resources here. 
and they have slaves over there and they have indentured servants over here and they're all bringing it to England. And now they have all this leisure time and all they do is have parties and figure out who's in love with who and who has the most pounds per month that they've inherited. You know, who's the richest basically. So that to me is a really serious miseducation. Um, if Indonesians or people in the developing countries, if they need to learn English, because at the moment anyway, English is the international language for scholarly work, academic work, scientific work, you know, the lab reports need to be in English. Fine, except that you should be able to teach Indonesian history and culture, Indonesian literature, Indonesian uh, legends and uh, fables, Indonesian myths, but just use English words. So the kids grow up learning them in Indonesian at home, and now they can learn English by seeing, oh, that's that. And so they're using analogies, but they're also the substance of the English story is something they can identify with. So so I think that's really important. And I think somebody's got to call out that that isn't, you know, is that what we're really doing? I remember teaching in an inner city preschool in Chicago just for a couple of weeks once, but the kids were reading a book about a farm and farm animals. They didn't know anything about that. They should be reading books about the city, you know, about things they can identify with. And so I, this is really important. It doesn't just happen in the colonizing system. It happens in colonization within a country between the rich and the poor. So deep reading is important. It develops, and, and especially empathy. So you should have stories where rich people uh, have an experience of empathy with somebody who is poor and they change their mind and they change their way of living and they start becoming more generous. I mean, there's lots of stories you could tell. Some of them you just, that's art, you're just making it up. Some of it is actually stories. Um, Melinda Gates and Bill Gates, it took them a while before they started being generous. Um, and they went to Africa. I remember, you know, reading this because they're about my age. And so I kind of followed Bill Gates as he rose up. And they went to Africa and the, his first philanthropy was to put a computer in every library in Africa. <laughs> and, you know, that was a bit naive because most people what they realized is a lot of kids are dying of malaria and they can't usually go to the library and use a computer if they're dying of malaria. So, <laughs> so then the Gates Foundation started getting a little more serious and thoughtful about how they give money, you know, and they give to stopping these infectious diseases. They also give to education anyway, just lots of different stuff. And Melinda is very committed to promoting women's empowerment, women's education, women's skills, women's support groups, women's uh, self-help groups, just lots of stuff. Um, but anyway, so there's lots of potential for lots of education that would focus on deep reading, analogies, and empathy. Uh, from a psychological or the theological perspective, Reading provides us with a moral laboratory for our thoughts. So another thing you could do in this curriculum is include uh, con stories about Confucius or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, where they get into these situations that the student can identify with. They can think of their own examples. And so, you know, Religious pluralism and humanitarianism is built right into the storytelling, into the history, tell, into the learning history, all the humanity stuff. Definitely, they're all the same themes, the virtues and vices. There's just a lot of potential for a really good curriculum based on, I mean, these people who have come together and they have a basic 
uh, Aristotelian, or I would say just classical virtues foundation that they agree on, they could come up with lots of really creative ideas about how to set up a curriculum that would enable students to do deep reading. So they would make analogies with their own lives and their own societies, but also religious pluralism and um, natural classical humanism would be built in to the process. Um, even with math and science, which are, you know, you learn it in a detached way. You could tell a story about Einstein when he was a little boy. He had a compass he was obsessed about. I mean, you can tell stories about these scientists or these mathematicians that the students could identify with. And maybe they would want to become a scientist or a mathematician. Okay. The negative effect of technology on our ability to read. All right. By most measures, all people's attention spans, not just children's, are about half of what they were 10 to 15 years ago. This chain of changes affects the allocation of time to critical analysis and empathy, which influences what we read, what is published, why we read it all. The more information we have, the more likely many of us are to turn to unchallenging, less dense, less syntactically complex information. This is the stuff of threat to any democracy. And as an American, I can say I'm really worried about this because America has, you know, these military armaments of mass destruction, and we have all sorts of capitalist um, entrepreneur products that destroy people's bodies, they destroy people's minds, they destroy people's relationships. And I am witness to it, right? My students are, some of them are definitely addicted to their cell phones and they're very resentful when I call them out, and tell them not to use it. Um, uh, students' attention spans, it's a real problem. Uh, as far as I know, some of them might never have read a whole book before they go to college. They don't know what a footnote is. Some of them, right? But the overall, just this dissipation of consciousness, even with the smart kids, they go on podcasts all the time. And it, I myself tried to retire <laughs> four years ago. And then I, I was going to work part-time and all this. And I had a plan for sort of staying intellectually active, staying engaged, doing reading for a class, class prep. All of a sudden, you know, I lost both jobs. And my concentration level just collapsed um, because I, I didn't have any sort of, I'd been thinking about these things since I was like third grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, and all of a sudden nothing, you know, all these neural maps that I had developed and, um, and I started listening to the news because I was very scared about Trump, um, starting with 2016, after he got elected, I was in Indonesia and I did have access to some news, uh, American news about Trump, but I just found that this is not helpful. And so I've stepped back and I read books. You know, I read during COVID, I read 350 page books about what's been going on in my country. So I can get this sort of map, right? Every time I read another book about our torture system or whatever, I, there's another neural map in my head, right? Oh, that, yeah. And then how does that fit with that? I'm literally constructing a set of neural maps, which together constitute my mind, which is my idea of the good. So every time I read a book, I attach it to the other books. So I'm developing a map of how our culture has been sold out to the billionaires. And that's motivated by my ideas of good and evil. 
and Aristotle's view that greed is the political evil. Greed is what destroys political association. And all of these books that I've read, 50 books, 60 books, they're all pieces in this collapse of our democracy. But so, I mean, I find it satisfying and I, I'd like to share what I've done, but I just don't see other people doing that. Even smart people will just find their comfort zone and pick out the latest um, outrage, I would say, by the people they disagree with. This is really bad because not only is it a dissipation of your brain, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that, but it's usually also connected with outrage or anger, which is a secondary emotion related to fear. And so, so the cell phones have, are very damaging and they're competing. Very, the marketers say this, they use neuroscience to, they use what they know about the brain to destroy our ability, to steal our attention, to destroy our ability to think and to reflect and to develop an idea of good, the good and to have long range goals and to keep our priorities straight. All those things in Aristotle's virtues, right? How do you flourish? Well, how? what should I do today to flourish, to help other people flourish every day? And it has to be, you have to always be thinking ahead and thinking big picture and training yourself to do that. But if you have a cell phone that's designed to grab your attention through either pleasure or fear, um, you're in trouble. Like there's no way your brain can work. <laughs> um, so you're messing up your natural neural mechanism and you're messing up this natural development of the brain into a mind and then into a strong mind, strength of mind, and then into wisdom, practical wisdom. Um, so, so I plan this semester to assign my students chapters from a book about what cell phones have done and social media has done to their brains. And hopefully they'll, I'll tell them you, you should read because you would learn a lot <laughs> about how you're getting manipulated. Middle-aged people are exploiting your brain to get rich and walking away with their money and not paying taxes to help you get a better education. So you should care about this. Like you have a lot at stake. So I'm hoping that maybe, you know, they'll realize they have to step back and reflect. Um, so how do you take that and figure out how to um, extend that internationally to some kind of international curriculum so we can stop? Because the ability to deep read, the ability to reflect is necessary to preserve a democracy. So deep reading has implications far beyond the individual. If readers in a society never learn to develop and use their critical analysis and empathy. So critical thinking is, you know, here's thinking, well, here's sensation. And Aristotle has this, he has this whole, in his view of the soul, starts out with each sense and then the collective, the common sense, time, space, perspective, and then uh, cognition and then memory. He's got a great hierarchy here. Um, but critical analysis involves thinking about your thinking. So he says at a certain point, the mind has accumulated a whole lot of knowledge about a whole lot of stuff. And then, aha, the mind thinks itself. So you have this aha reaction that, oh, I am the creature who's capable of understanding the world, the patterns in a world that's understandable. Like that's who I am. And once you do that, then you can critically think about everything around you. Like, how should I think about that? Right? And then other people disagree. And that's where you really start developing your mind, your idea of the good. You're a, you develop a vision 
of what you think flourishing is and how based on that vision how people ought to live what how they what they ought to prioritize so they can become fully human okay and empathy is also chosen right you choose to have empathy for other people versus to see other people as pawns in your desire to get richer or more famous or more powerful, right? Are they pawns in your game? Are they functions of your ego? Or do you have empathy? You have a common humanity. All right. If readers never learn to develop critical analysis and empathy, we will not have the means to sustain a truly democratic society. Instead, we have citizens who are susceptible to fake news, falsely fueled fears, and falsely raised hopes of demagoguery. True, deep literacy is essential for a democratic society. The more information we have, the more likely many of us are to turn to unchallenging, undemanding, less dense, less syntactically complex information. This is the stuff of a threat to any democracy. Complexity is reduced, beauty vanishes. And as a college professor, as a college student, you should take the lead. You should be a role model like liberal arts education. Be a role model in somebody that reads, that thinks critically, that prioritizes, and that has an idea of the good and acts on the basis of that in everything they do. So Indonesian scholars and educators could make a substantial contribution to the development of this global curriculum. Their national curriculum is already trying to combine Aristotle's moral virtues with the intellectual virtues, even if they don't call it Aristotle, they do get they, you know, they could say Muhammad is interested in educating the whole person. I've read stuff about that, so I know that's true. Um, Mr. Marif said Muhammad is interested in educating for character. He's also, Marif is also interested in getting Indonesian students to study STEM and to move Indonesia forward economically, but within the context of being um, uh a good Muslim. So um, it's already trying to include a very plur pluralistic understanding of God, Indonesia, into the K through 12 curriculum in every subject. It's already uniting faith with science and all the other academic disciplines. So Indonesia's huge population and the percent of citizens who live in remote areas makes this project difficult but the curricula and the professionals are developing, but the curricula the professionals are developing should be created with the goal of engaging with scholars from around the world, including developing nations and developed nations. And also the, again, these uni university community engagement projects have a real potential for moving the country forward I guess, you know, the thought of somebody getting organized and developing a curriculum for university community engagement, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing, a, um, I know I have a friend, one of the villages had water, clear water, and they set up a water factory. Okay, well, there's all of that, the factory, but there's all this other stuff you could do in that context. You could... Uh, have people from different religious traditions and different ethnicities, gender. You can overcome those borders, boundaries. You can also uh, work with the people there to write a history and so of the project, but you could also have them reading history of their village. You can, you know, use the occasion to cultivate reading and writing and um, the and um, learning how to prioritize the well-being of the village, and having the villagers like Gotong Royang come together and stay together. You know, okay, we finished that project. Now, what's the next project? And within the context of gender, ethnicity, pluralism, 
Um, so there's just a lot of potential there. And, um, and you know, everybody can contribute. To me, the big issue might now be how to get enough people together to create enough of a community. And that's where I think this conference was intended to get a lot of people together and get something started. So they wouldn't feel so isolated after the conference is over. So let's hope for the best. And uh, I'm getting excited about trying to figure out what I should do in the next five years.